right, so we are on. Uh, welcome, everybody. I know a lot of people are part of the community, but we have some new people joining because of uh, Xavier's uh, uh, talk today. So for that reason, I've taken the opportunity to give a, a little bit intro about uh, the community, Quantum Formalism, which is a uh, an online community by Zyko Group um, that provides free online courses uh, aimed at exposing abstract mathematical topics to a diverse group of uh, STEM professionals uh, looking into um, coming into the quantum computing industry. Very often these profession these uh, these uh, professionals, you know, they have taken uh, courses uh, from Kiskit and they want to take their uh, quantum computing journey to the next level, but they soon realize they need to learn more mathematics than what's on the Kiskit book. <laughs> For example, understand what Lie groups are and this type of stuff. So this is this is the, um, the intended audience for quantum formalism. Um, and recently, obviously, uh, chat GPT stuff has been making uh, hype. You know, everyone, uh, uh, you know, I've heard about it. So to assist our course, uh, our free courses, we created uh, quantum formalism GPTs, you know, a, a collection of GPTs. There's one called quantum formalism, which is to do just with quantum. <laughs> we added a lot of resources into it um, so that, uh, you know, the thing can use uh, rags in order to try to answer as many um, use helpful, uh, give as many uh, helpful answers as possible. And bear in mind, you know, most of the time it makes up, a lot of times it makes up this stuff, but we hope this uh, helps those who have some sort of a friction with abstraction. <laughs> so this is the the, uh, the reason why we created this as an assistant, like a, a, some sort of a lightweight learning tool. It's also good for uh, for the others because uh, if uh, chat GPT makes a mistake, <laughs> you can actually, that's a good thing that you are able to spot that it told something, it told you something that's uh, mathematically uh, nonsense. So either way, it's good for both who are uh, um, struggling with the abstraction, uh, but also for those who are comfortable with it and um, and just go and test their knowledge with the chat GPT. Um, so before I introduce our guest, <laughs> just to put uh, today's talk into context, obviously quantum computing or quantum technology in general is uh, um, an emerging industry. You know, I remember like uh, 20 years ago, I attended uh, as a mathematics student. <laughs> um, we used to, uh, my, so the department, the number theorist, the head of number theory at the uh, mathematics department used to run this um, uh, sessions where we try to crack RSA challenges. Back then they used to publish uh, composite numbers and the idea is to come up with the uh, ways of uh, cracking it, <laughs> cracking these challenges so we could win a prize or something. And then in that contest, um, he invited someone um, to do a talk on quantum computing, in particular the, um, the impact of it into cryptography, in this case RSA. And I remember back then, you know, this was more than 20 years ago, I would say probably 30, <laughs> almost 30. Um, there were a lot of physicists on the audience. Most of them were very skeptic about uh, uh, the possibility of engineering this system. They were like, okay, yeah, it's nice in theory, the Shor's algorithm and these things, you know, but how can you engineer, <laughs> you know, uh, um, a device that can actually execute this algorithm in order to break RSA? So I must say back then, obviously, I was a mathematics, a humble, a mathematics student. So, you know, I um, I sided with the physicists saying like, OK, yeah, this is one of those things that, uh, you know, it's nice in theory, but uh, in practice, it's uh, it's probably um, hard, um, if not impossible <laughs> to engineer. But then a couple of years ago, you know, obviously these devices exist. Um, but they don't exist in, uh, in, in, in a way that, you know, um, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we envision them, right, in order to do these, uh, um, to solve, uh, say, RSA, for example, you know, we are nowhere near uh, that point, but they do exist. The question is, obviously, whether the engineering challenges that Xavier, uh, in his arguments, he will make, whether this uh, will be overcome uh, ever or in the near term, in order to make uh, um, the holy grail quantum computer possible. But it's an emerging market, you know, there's a, a lot of um, uh, investment, uh, government investment in particular, going into it, you know, and there is whole sort of uh, um, companies uh, starting out, you know, um, around, you know, quantum technologies, in particular quantum computing. 
and also research universities, you know, forming, uh, you know, research groups uh, across the spectrum in quantum technologies. So it's, it's a huge thing <laughs> at the moment. Uh, the question obviously everyone asks is whether it will live up to the expectations that people have. Um, and also, um, sadly, a lot of uh, <laughs> since it, it leads to a lot of sensational, uh, you know, things coming out, you know, like uh, like these things here, you know. Um, but yeah, without a further ado, I would like to um, introduce uh, our uh, guest uh, speaker, uh, Xavier Vental. Uh, he is a condensed matter physicist with the research interest in quantum nanoelectronics, uh, spintronics, and strongly correlated systems. And he currently works at the uh, CEA Grenoble. So Grenoble is in France. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to you, Xavier. Thank you so much again uh, for uh, joining the community to share um, your, uh, your, uh, your, your views, your, your return. Um, into the into the thing into the uh, quantum computing yeah thank you bombardé uh, and thanks thanks a lot for the invitation uh so maybe i should try and share my screen Let's yes see. you should uh, be able to share indeed uh, hello to share screen uh no maybe okay let's see do you see my screen yeah it's loading something loading Okay, I see a blank. Uh, yeah, something blank. No, for, yeah, for some reason it, it uh, kicked me out. Let me try again. Okay. Share now. Hello. Um, let, let me check the the configurations. You should have access to these slides. Um, yeah, everyone can share the screen indeed. So you should. It? I don't know. It, it, each time I try, it kicks me out of the website. Um, huh. Let me try again. Sorry for this, everyone. Okay. Share screen. I hope Google. Hmm. Are you trying to share a, a specific uh, thing, tab on the browser or the entire screen? Uh, I'm Maybe. trying both. And, okay. uh, but it doesn't even ask me. Uh, he asked me. Yeah, the problem is, is I think, is the security of Safari. Because each time. Ah, it... okay, 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 okay. It could be that. Uh, do you have any other browser? Is there any chance? Ah, uh, yes, okay. Maybe I, you're right. I will try. Uh, Chrome or something or some another oh. browser. Yeah, please. Sorry, sorry for that. So Xavier, uh, Xavier will uh, will come back once he switches uh, the browser. Well, in the meantime, I would like to know people on the chat. Yeah, okay, so someone is asking, uh, do you have reference to where you got uh, the okay. quantum data market size figure? Well, it's coming from McKinsey. <laughs> Indeed, there are crazy numbers. Uh, that's that's the point I was saying about that. <laughs> okay, so Baron is saying Michael Nielsen is suggesting one trillion market size a few years ago. <laughs> yes, uh, Xavier, thank you. Um, you are back again. Yes. Uh, okay. Now with Chrome, it looks different. Let's see. Share. Uh, okay. Probably needs to. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Something else. On the screen, okay. Mm -hmm. 
I'm almost there. I need. I think I need to to set up the. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Take your time. Uh, in the meantime, I'll check here on the thing. Um, on the chat. Yeah. Indeed, Baron. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where they come. This is an emerging market in the making, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, I guess they they probably just run the survey or something sending it to, to the companies which is probably not the right way to do it because every company will make uh, inflate their projection i guess i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so um okay this time i hope it will work oh fantastic uh let's see oh. okay can you see my screen something is loading yeah we can we can see yeah fantastic thank you Okay, excellent. Oof, sorry for that. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you. Good. Okay, let's get started. Uh, I think we, we are not so many, so if, if at least if you have some questions uh, relating to to understanding of what I'm saying, don't hesitate to stop me. It's okay if I if I don't have you know time to cover everything. It's, it's better if I cover a little bit and you really understand what I mean than uh, covering everything. Uh, so uh, as you said, actually, so this is a, so this is a cover. Okay, I, I, I apologize. It's written in French, but. If you read the first line, it's, it's written computer science, quantum computers, it's for tomorrow. And if you look at here, it's a bit small, but actually this is from a year 2000. So, so indeed, quantum computing has been, has been there for a while. Um, and so what I want to do today is, is um, essentially uh, go through the basics of, of quantum computing uh, from the point of view of a computer scientist but with a small twist, which is that I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a physicist. So I will try to make the connection uh, to what it means in, uh, in reality for the actual hardware that, that guys are trying to build in the labs uh, and, and point out the difficulties. This is really what I would like to do. And for that, I'm not going to cover uh, something complicated like Shor or Grover. Uh, I mean, they are not so complicated, but I will really want to stick to something very simple. Uh, so the example I will I will try to discuss a bit in detail today is uh, is this how to calculate prime times three. So you know I'm, I'm not setting the goal too high, but you will see that already doing something like that on a quantum computer is not a piece of cake. And uh, so I, I try that I will you know manage to convey what are the difficulties uh, uh, on this journey. Uh, and so uh, because you guys are mathematicians and because the conclusions of this part one are a bit depressing, I mean you will see that I'm not a big uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of quantum science. I've been, I've been doing that all my life, uh, but I, I'm not a strong believer that this will actually work, uh, this project of doing compute, computing on, on a quantum device. So I will, I will have a small part two. I will try to save some, some time in for the small part two. Well, I will tell you about some really interesting stuff that are going on in what um, I'd like to call quantum-inspired algorithms. Uh, so that these are algorithms actually run on classical hardware, so I mean your laptop essentially, uh, that, are on, that are breaking uh, a lot of walls at the moment. And uh, I have a lot of faith that these things might actually deliver uh, part of the promises that have been made for quantum computer. OK, so that would be the optimistic part of, uh, of this talk. So let's get started. So on the left here, you have all the quantum physics on the on, on essentially every single piece of physics that you are aware of can be uh, made as a platform for quantum computing because essentially everything is quantum so here you have Rydberg atoms superconducting circuits NV centers photonic modes these are uh, trapped ions um, those are I think, silicon uh, qubits and those are silicon germanium qubits so essentially everything you know about about physics uh, can be turned into a quantum computer because there are two level systems everywhere and on the right, you have a quantum circuit. This is the point of view of the mathematician of quantum science. And really, what I want to do, so I'm, I'm, I'm really coming from the left. This is what I've been spending, I spent uh, my, my life on. Uh, but I would like to really start from the right and, and try to translate into what it means from, from what is on the left. A little bit. I mean, I won't do physics much. I mean, I will, there will be essentially zero physics in this uh, talk. But I will I'll try at least to get the specs right. Uh, and if you want more physics, you can ask me at, at the end. I mean, this is really, um, I mean, okay. So there's only so much we can squeeze in uh, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, and also, I, I, I mean, I was not so sure, so I, uh, I really started from the basics. And if everybody knows everything about uh, the beginning, uh, just please stop me and I can just uh, hurry the, the beginning. So uh, so physicists, we, we uh, so, okay, uh, 
uh, essentially we are working if you have one qubit you have a state here and the way we write vector is, is through this strange notation and it's the, the nice thing about this cat notation is that you can put the name in inside and so you can have actually a very very big basis and it's, it works uh, very well so uh, a qubit is a linear combination of zero and one a and b are complex numbers and the nice thing is that when you have n qubits now you go to the tensorial product of this space and now your state is a sum over i1 i2 i3 so all these are qubits and all this takes value zero and one so you have now two to the n your basis has two to the n uh, uh, different uh, basis set um, and your state is actually now given by a huge vector of two to the n complex number okay and and the, the fact that you have this huge vector is really uh, the reason why there is hope that you might get some exponential speed up some sort of quantum parallelism somewhere along the way uh, this is a quantum program i mean what the quantum circuit and you really read it like music so you essentially uh, you have uh, one line per qubit and when you have uh, a box like this means you operate on qubit one uh, a box like this means that you operate on qubit one and qubit two and when i say operate it means that you start from whatever initial states that you have usually all the qubits are in state zero that means you just multiply your state uh, by these operators so essentially what we are doing is a much is a bunch of matrix vector multiplication where the u's are unitaries that only uh, actually uh, talk to a few degrees of freedom so it's essentially a, a, a complicated rotation that we are trying to do on the system. Um, and actually, I, I'd like just to, to stop briefly to say that from a physicist's point of view, this is weird. Um, physicists, we, we think in terms of energy and time. So the, the, the object that we are used to are Lagrangian or Hamiltonian like this. And, and the unitary matrix that we apply are essentially the exponential of this uh, Hamiltonian. And so uh, essentially what computer scientists assume is that they assume that they are given the use and the physicists will just figure out the detail on how the hell you actually engineer your Hamiltonian to get this use. And I will just do the same, okay? We have no particles, no fermion, no boson, no space. Uh, so it's very, essentially it's quantum mechanics stripped down to its, its core, uh, its bare minimum. I mean, remove something from, from this model and you, you don't have any quantum mechanics left. Uh, so this use, we will work, be working with a few. For instance, this is uh, the Pauli matrix. So it's essentially, it's, uh, it goes, it's, it's, a, it's a not operator. It, it transforms zero and one and one to zero. Control not, it does nothing if the first qubit is in state zero and it flips the second qubit if the first qubit is in state one. Adamar creates a superposition of zero and one. And you need at least one, which is a, a, like, a non-trivial rotation, something that takes you out of the X, Y, Z plane. And this is usually the T-gate. Okay, so this is a game, the world of game. We, we have uh, these uh, matrices, essentially. Uh, you see, they, are, they have indices because we can apply them on, on, on selected qubits. And the question is, uh, how can we do something with this? Okay, so let's go back to five times three. Essentially, we want to find a set of unitaries uh, that if we start with something which is X, let's say written in, in binary form, like uh, this would be five, and Y, let's say uh, this would be three, and you want something that gives you 15 in this case, which is one, 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 okay? Um, so of course, classical logic is very simple to do on a classical computer, but on a quantum computer, actually, it's not totally trivial because you want it to be reversible, right? The, the matrices are unitary. Uh, and, and if you do classical logic, like for instance, if you have two bits A and B and you do A and B, uh, you cannot go back to where you were. So at, 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 at minimum, you need as many output uh, as you have input if you want to have a chance uh, to do something reversible. Uh, but if you just do that, actually, it's not enough. So for instance, if you try this one, A and B, on the copy of A, uh, you can check that zero and, zero, zero and one, zero give you the same result, which means that you cannot go back, so it's not reversible. So if you want to do reversible logic, you need at least three qubit gates. Uh, and for instance, you need this one, which is called the Toffoli, which is the control, control not, like uh, A, B. Uh, so on, on, for instance, if you have a, B, and zero, uh, then if A is one and B is one, then control, control, not will go to one. So it's, it's actually the, the, the A and B, so you can start to do logic. Okay, very well, so we need three, three qubit gate. Uh, the thing is that in, in um, nature typically gives you two-body interaction, so it's not typically totally trivial to build these things uh, in the lab, but you can actually do them with a bunch of control, not uh, on T gates, 
uh, you know, so for instance, this is a circuit. Uh, you can check that will build uh, the Toffoli gate from uh, two qubit gates on one qubit gate. Uh, if you look at this, already the reason it works is actually through uh, a very complex set of uh, constructive and destructive interference, right? The, you, at, at some point in the middle, you create interferences and you make sure that everything that has to be zero is destructive and everything that has to be uh, one is constructive. Uh, and and uh, for those of you that have done uh, uh, interference experiments in their use, like uh, I don't know, with the Mickelson, for instance, uh, already when you have two paths, it's not totally trivial to adjust the destructive and the constructive uh, things. Here, you already have eight paths, but it's, it's doable, it's been done, but it's, it's not uh, totally trivial to adjust things so that you get exactly uh, what you want. So this is a circuit to multiply three times five. Here, you recognize three, so it's uh, one, one, so you put two uh, X operator, and this is five, X, X, here, and nothing on the second qubit. And this is where you will put the register when you put the result. And you see, you need a bunch uh, of control here. It's not exactly control, control not. It's something slightly more complicated. There is a, a rotation here in the middle. But essentially, these are uh, cousin of the control, control not. You see, so if you, and then if you need to unfold each of them into Toffolis, and at the end, you get a bunch of Android or so control not, Android T gates. You will see why the T gates are important a bit later on a few other rotations. Assuming that you have perfect connectivity, which means that all the qubits are connected, which is which is never the case in practice, except for some very specific platforms that do not scale up. Uh, usually, you have a, a connection to your neighbors, and that that means that if you want to transform this circuit into something that you could actually uh, make it work on the actual hardware, usually you need much more gates than this. But you see already hundred gates. Oops, hundred uh, gates to multiply three times five. Okay, now I, I will I will say a little bit of um, uh, relate to physics on the bare minimum of what we need to know. Um, so we are essentially doing small rotations, right? We are doing small rotation, uh, and we are rotating something which is analog, uh, right? So the, the, the state, internal state of the quantum computer, is essentially a, a big arrow in a huge uh, in a huge space, in a huge sphere. Um, and every time you make a one rotation, you, you let's say you, you want to do a pi over two rotation over the x axis, well, you're going to do pi over two plus or minus something, right? You, 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 with, whenever you do something continuous, there is always a small error that you're going to do. Maybe it's very, very tiny, maybe it's not so tiny, depends on, on how good you are with your engineering, but you will do a, a, small, uh, a small error. And that means that the, at the end, the fidelity of your calculation, which you can translate most of the time into the probability of success, is going to decay exponentially with the number of gates that you apply in your circuit. And epsilon is typically the error per gate, right? And this is really almost a universal law. I mean, there is, it's, it's almost impossible to... You can prove it in some cases. You always observe it in practice. Um, and and uh, it's, it's just there. And, and you can actually... So this is a very basic version. You can actually uh, divide it into different kind of process, two qubit gate, or zero qubit, one qubit gate, and so on. Uh, I call it the universal law of misery. It's not specific to quantum computers. I mean, you have it in any analog machine, in any system. But you will see when you put numbers that actually it's pretty drastic here. Uh, something important is that idle times also counts. When you do nothing, you actually entangle with the rest of the world, typically with other degrees of freedom. Um, or, or just you, your tracking of what's happening is actually uh, not, not good enough. For instance, you think that you are processing at a given speed. But maybe you are slightly processing slightly faster or maybe slightly slower. And so, so you, the, the way, uh, even if you do nothing, essentially, uh, you lose fidelity. And also, very importantly, we work blindly, which means that we, you cannot look at the state and try to correct whatever is happening. Uh, because, because whenever you measure something in quantum mechanics, the wave function collapse. Right. And so all these things together make it actually, OK, this is the challenge when you start a, a, a quantum computation, you, you are essentially racing around the clock. Uh, and you need to, to build up your entanglement, build up your interesting state before you lose uh, due to decoherence. And really the question is, uh, I mean, how fast can you be uh, to, to build up interesting things before uh, decoherence gets you? Uh, I made a list here for, okay, one, one system that I know particularly well, which are essentially uh, people trying to build quantum computers out of the regular electronics, so essentially silicon uh, mob set technology. Uh, and, you know, a lot of things that can go on. Um, 
okay, I won't, I won't go through all these things, but uh, that can undo go on. I mean, these are not things that came out of my uh, mind. They're actually things that are measured in the lab. At the end of the day, a good uh, uh, order of magnitude is typically we have 1% error. This is typically what we are. You will see number better than that if you read the literature. You should be careful because usually these numbers that are quoted are for very, very tiny system. And when you scale up things and when you put all the things together on not only the best uh, working part of the device, you, you typically get 1% in the best cases. Uh, for instance, if you remember the Google Supremacy experiment in 2019, uh and okay we, a lot of things could be said about the supremacy aspect and i i, I won't say them because it's it's a, sem it's a seminar in itself uh, but typically what they really achieved was to make 53 qubit work together with a fidelity of global fidelity of 1.4 percent so at the end they, you really in this main curve of the of the paper you see the fidelity going down exponentially with an error of 1.4 percent per gate for two qubit gate uh, which was already uh, a huge achievement. Maybe now IBM is a bit better. Uh, maybe it's down to 1% or slightly better. Uh, through actually amazing work. So if you put this uh, uh, into three times five and you just uh, look at the gate count I gave you, uh, you just get that the probability of success is, is, is more than 10%. Essentially that you cannot uh, multiply three times five on the quantum computer right now. Uh, which is a bit weird because if you remember, like uh, the second biggest paper in the field uh, before the quantum supremacy was the one by Van der Siepen. And what Levin did is an experiment, it was a, an MR experiment at that time, was to factorize 15. You know? So how the, how, the, how the hell can we factorize 15 if we cannot multiply three times five? It, it looks a bit um, uh, uh, strange. And actually they didn't then factorize 15. Uh, what they did was to bypass all the classical logic of the algorithm because they just didn't have the fidelity to do it, so they just hard coded the result. Uh, and, and another way to say that is that if you wanted to scale up what uh, uh, Van der Siepen did on a big uh, system, you know, to break RSA, for instance, you would need to hard code all the multiplications, you know, all the way to uh, uh, <laughs> all the way to, to uh, essentially until you have factorized the number um, before you can actually start your your computation. So, so okay. So the classical logic is too big. Uh, I found these guys that tried to, with uh, trapped ions. So trapped ions are really, really good, and they have all-to-all -all connectivity. They don't scale well, but uh, and they tried one plus one a while ago, uh, and you see uh, one plus one. They got seven. They got uh, two seventy percent of the time, or sixty percent of the time, which is not bad, but it's not great neither. I mean, it's one plus one, right? So that's typically uh, things that if you try and. IBM, uh, and if you find something different, probably they they are doing something fishy. Okay, so that's that's essentially what I wanted to say about uh, about multiplying five times three. Uh, and if you um, are you still with me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. We still. Yeah. Because I heard a, a weird beep. <laughs> um, so I won't, I won't cover all the applications that have been foreseen, but just to give you numbers, if you want to break RSA, you need 11 digits in this, uh, um, in this like two qubit, uh, two qubit gate. Uh, if you want to solve an NP-compete problem with Grover, it's, it's, it's much worse. Actually, this I think is even more out of the... Uh, you want to do uh, chemistry, chemistry has been sold a lot, also 12 digits to do something that we know actually how to do on, uh, on classical hardware very well. So bottom line, it's it's actually very difficult to get to get down to this. Uh, so we we miss eight order of magnitude in fidelity. So at that stage, uh, people came up with a very very uh, nice scheme, quantum error correction. And I don't have time to cover quantum error correction in detail. I would just cover what it en entails, and I won't cover the math. And I'm I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I can answer some questions uh, after if you want. Um, so the idea of quantum correction error correction is. Okay, uh, the qubits are fragile. Uh, let's try to make logical qubits out of several physical qubits. So we will enlarge the Hilbert space. So for instance, we will encode a, zero, a logical zero into zero, 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 and a logical one into one, one, one. This is a, a bit too simple, but, but you, you get the idea. Um, that's the first idea, right? Uh, and the second thing is that uh, once you have done that, you have enlarged your uh, Hilbert space, but you want to stick only to this small subspace. You, you want only to stay in 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. You don't want to be in 0, 1, 0. This is not a... So 
Uh, to do that, you will, will, you will measure the parity, for instance, of the first two qubits, and you will check that the parity is always, uh, in this case, uh, uh, even. Okay? So these two bits are the same, and these two bits are the same. And, and so it's, it's a measurement, but you are not measuring the state itself, the, the logical state. You are measuring something orthogonal to it, so that it should not affect your, uh, uh, your quantum computation. So, um, so you will need to do this partial measurement, which are called syndromes, over and over, very fast, uh, to prevent decoherence to, uh, to, to, uh, to take in. And of course, you need more qubits, uh, because um, here I put three, but uh, in reality, you will see it's much more than that. Um, <coughs> control electronics, cooling power, etc., cetera, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to account for all these new qubits. Um, and what this is what the theory says, is that uh, if your error is below a certain threshold, uh, then your effective error actually scales exponentially with the number of physical qubit per logical one. This is the case, for instance, for the surface code, which is probably the, the I mean, it's really the best uh, kind of approach at the moment. I mean, the most robust one. Uh, this threshold is typically 1%, so we are at threshold, or maybe if slightly better than threshold right now, even though nobody could actually show any, uh, uh, any actually uh, gain right now, any significant gain in the effective error. So, but if we get this below, then in principle you could get, you know, as get an error, effective error, as small as you as you want, and you get an exponential gain. So it's it's, it's crazy gain, right? Um, so this is a surface code, and this is how it works. You uh, you have a uh, data qubits are the yellow things here, and in in between here the x is is a, is a an ANSIA qubit that you will use to measure this syndrome. So, for instance, you will what you will do is you will have uh, every every cycle, every clock cycle, you will just run this circuit here, uh, trying to entangle your north, east, south, and west uh, qubits here uh, with your ANSIA to measure the syndrome. And this essentially measures the parity that I, I alluded to before. Okay, and you do that on the x axis and on the z axis for the other ones, and this is supposed to stabilize your state. Uh, now, if you want to create a qubit, you need to essentially stop measuring some. Uh, of these things to, to allow some uh, degree of freedom to, to, to be floating. Um, and for instance, one way to do that is to make holes, right? And let's say the hole corresponds to a qubit. And if you want to do a control node, you need to make a loop around uh, another, another qubit. And the loop means stopping to measure this syndrome, starting to measure this syndrome here that I put uh, in white. Now they, they would become red. And, and, and little by little, you move here by stopping to, to measure uh, the one on the right, and, and start to measure this on the left. Uh, and, and after a certain number of cycles, you have made a round trip, and this is your, your control node for the surface code. One way to do it. OK, so now we, we can make a new qubit count and assumed 0.01% uh, error level, which is a, a, at least a big factor 10 better than the best uh, hardware, for instance, in a superconducting circuit. Um, now you need a, a total of 1,000 qubits. Uh, on on the you know 45 million control nodes, 10,000 cycles typically. Uh, okay, so you see that you, you get a huge increase, uh, a huge overhead, and, and we are still doing three times five. Huh? We are still doing three times five, and and if you compare that with a, with the same thing on a classical computer, you better have some pretty good quantum parallelism later on because you are losing a huge prefactor here. Um, this was just, um, uh, okay, um, so making a, a surface code is one thing, making the logical qubit is one thing, and then uh, since you are doing your best to protect your qubit a lot, actually it makes, it becomes very difficult to, uh, to actually uh, uh, manipulate them. And so, for instance, you need something, there's always one gate which is hard, uh, it's a T-gate for the surface code. And you will need something which is sort of called T-gate factory. On the, I, won't, I won't enter into the details of the T-gate factory, but it's, it's a kind of quantum error correction code of, of quantum error correction code. So it's a quantum error correction code made of logical qubit with circuits that looks like this. Um, so, and, and, and it increase your, your uh, uh, you know, now you go to about one million cycle if you have just one, one factory, but one factory uh, increase your number of qubit to 2000. Uh, and if you want to do things in parallel to not to increase the number of cycles, then you need to go about uh, uh, 10,000 qubits. 
Uh, and we are again uh, still talking about uh, still qubit talking about uh, doing five times three. Uh, and there are a lot of things that I will not cover in detail, but uh, typically quantum error correction code correct for some errors. Uh, and, 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 and there are errors that are not corrected. They are called in the in the in the business they are called uh, uh, correlated errors. But but from physics they are actually not correlated. It means that uh, something is going on that is not caught by this uh, uh, by this quantum error correction code. Typically you can if you know what is the error, which is not always easy. Uh, you can build a more complex code uh, with more on C qubits and a co more complex uh, uh, syndrome analysis, and you will, me will be able to turn this error into uh, and put it into there. But of course, you you lose on the threshold because you do more complex things, more on C qubits, so more possibility for errors. Uh, which means that, that I mean there is no such thing as you can gain without you know limit and go to absolute uh, uh, any. Uh, uh, any precision that you want. Uh, at some point, you're caught by physics, and we don't know yet where we will be. We know that, okay, we went up to 1%, 0 0.1%, uh, but beyond that is, is uncarted territory. And, uh, okay, that's essentially that, that was my introduction. I mean, trying to, I mean, that was uh, what I was asked to do. So I, I, I wrote this paper called Quantum House of Cards, where I looked at a lot of uh, aspects of quantum computing. As I think I covered everything. Um, pretty much every paragraph of this paper is a talk in itself, so I, I just made a very brief overview of, uh, of the uh, main idea, but we can discuss a bit later if we still have time. I still like to take five minutes, okay, we are a bit, uh, a bit late, I would like to take five minutes to, to discuss about uh, non-depressing stuff, stuff that works. Um, and that's the stuff I'm, I'm really interesting, uh, uh, interested in now, right now. So quantum computers on the left, and on the, the applications of quantum computers on the right, quantum chemistry, quantum matter, PDA, optimization problem. And these actually are all things uh, okay, that, that we have been trying to do with classical algorithms uh, for a long time. And so what I'd like to discuss briefly uh, is a, a, set, uh, uh, a set of, of a formalism, which is uh, tensor networks, which, which really lies somewhere in between. So the, the, essentially, when you look at a, uh, quantum circuit like that, it is a tensor network directly, so it's it's a natural thing to to uh, connect the two. The best simulators we have of quantum computers uh, are made of uh, of tensor networks, and there are a lot of things like quantum inspired algorithm. I will I will briefly allude to uh, that essentially translated into these tensor network things, and and we we were able to turn into actual uh, uh, algorithm that works very well to solve problems. And there is also a nice connection to AI. Uh, there is a lot of new AI algorithms uh, coming to tensor cross, uh, to tensor networks, and that are really changing the field right now. So I just want to very, very briefly uh, flash a couple of things. Um, the simplest tensor network that you can have, so this is your quantum state. And the simplest quantum uh, <coughs> tensor network that you can have is to write this psi here as a product of matrices. Just the product of matrices, like this. Okay. Um, on on picturally, we write it like this. This is a big tensor of psi, and now it's a product of, of of matrices. Which means that here, whenever you have a link connecting two things, so these are three like tensors. Whenever you have a link, you sum over it. And on this representation is going to be extremely uh, economical if the state has a moderate entanglement. And it turns out that many of the states that we are actually looking at that are interesting in nature, a lot of states that we see in quantum matter, for instance, are of moderate entanglement. Very high entanglement is usually boring. And, and, uh, and so that means that there is a way to compress these states, and you can really you can see that as a compression of this, like this is a... Uh, and that, that means that you have essentially uh, found some, uh, uh, from some structure in your state that you can exploit to do calculation. Right, and, and the reason I put these pictures here is that because if you have a random state, like uh, totally, uh, there is nothing to compress. But actually, the states that we are seeing in in reality in nature are actually not random, and this has a lot of structure, and we are trying to exploit this structure. Um, so let me take a very very simple example. You have a function f of x where x is uh, between zero and one, and you just discretize this function. Um, uh, on two to the power n point, 
right? So essentially, you have a sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma n are a bunch of uh, bits, uh, 0 and 1. And you, you can just discretize on 2 to the n points. And that essentially turns your function into a tensor with n, uh, with n uh, legs, right? And now if it is n legs, well, it's some sort of, uh, of uh, many body, many qubit wave function, right? And so maybe you can try to see the, what is the level of entanglement and try to decompose it using this tensor train that I put uh, before. So you can do that, for instance, here we did it. OK, it's not in 1D, it's in 2D. We, we took this particular function here. You see, it's been designed to be essentially ugly. And what is very nice here is that you have a 10 to the 12 points per dimension. So 10 to the 24 pixels, that's a lot of pixel. But at the end, the, the, the compressed function only needs 10 to the 5 numbers. So it's a huge compression level. And you see, if you take the compressed function and you zoom here, here, and you zoom here, and then you get these bands. Here, these bands correspond to this term, which so it's a small oscillations. And then if you zoom of something even tinier, you see these horizontal stripes that correspond to this term. So you have 10 to the 5 number, but you, you can actually capture the entire, uh, you know, the entire 2D function at all scales. You can even get the integral uh, to machine precision if you want and stuff like that. On the last slide I'd like to show you is that these techniques, um, let's say you want to solve a, a diffusion equation in 1D. Uh, it turns out that the quantum Fourier transform, so the quantum Fourier transform is really the, the, the stuff which is at the core of Shaw algorithm, uh, can be cast into the same uh, framework. Uh, and, if, and then when you apply it to a function uh, to, in form of tensor train, you get the quantum Fourier transform in log n instead of n log n. So you get your quantum Fourier transform exponentially faster. And then if you can do that, then you can solve the uh, diffusion equation very simply. You just Fourier transform with respect to x. And then you get the trivial equation, which you can solve analytically. And, and, and then you can actually uh, uh, Fourier transform back and get the solution. So this is typically, for instance, uh, we took a, a crazy initial uh, condition, so a, a rectangle here, uh, with some small oscillations. And uh, you can we put two frequencies here, if you size the zoom over there. And you see the, the solution at different time, uh, obtained again on the grid with a, a thousand beyond point, just because, you know, we could, uh, in a time which is essentially instantaneous. Um, OK, so essentially, that's cover what I wanted to say. And I will stop there. Uh, here are the conclusions. Uh, it's not easy to make a quantum computer. Uh, I mean, most of what I read uh, on the on the media, I mean, on the uh, <coughs> LinkedIn or things like that is, is essentially hype. I mean, uh, it does not correspond at all to where we are in the labs. Um, all the estimates I did were done using conservative uh, uh, theory. I mean, I, I don't think that, um, there is anything controversial there. Actually, I'm pretty sure because when I tried to publish my paper, it was reviewed by very optimistic people and they tried very hard to find any problem with that, and, and they could not. Uh, and now it's been reviewed by enough people that uh, I would know if I was wrong somewhere. Um, anything, the only thing that we should care about right now is a fidelity, right? Finding decoherence. Uh, so when you hear someone telling about, uh, well, you we have this number of qubits or that number of qubits, if they don't give you the fidelity, then it means that they are trying to, uh, you know, they are trying to oversell something like uh and, and essentially before you know i'm personally waiting for the time where we, we will go to uh the, the 10 to minus three percent error level when you know start, new things will start to show up and before that uh it's just uh just you know a lot of unwaving of hyping but there is no way we can do something useful with these quantum computers um i don't want to throw the baby with the water bath as we say there is a, a genuine revolution going on in quantum physics. I mean, uh, something really is going on. I mean, all this experiment that we are seeing now. Uh, when I was uh, uh, when I was a kid, I mean, we were we. I mean, these were like thought experiments. Um, but uh, but there is a that doesn't mean that we will be able to make computing with that. I mean, there is still a, a gap, which is a, it's not a gap. It's it's, a, it's an abyss actually. It's, it's huge. Uh, also, there is something a bit weird, I think, in the field that, uh, um, yeah, I mean, people are already jumping up to to do very, very advanced things on the software aspect, uh, which I think is, is a bit ahead of time. I mean, uh, 
Uh, we have people in my in close to in Grenoble, for instance, working on I don't know compilers for quantum computing on all kind of very very advanced things. Why we cannot still uh, do three times five? I think it's a bit too early. On the last, a lot of things are going on uh, on the classical part, classical algorithm. Uh, these quantum inspired things, AI. I mean, yeah, difficult to miss AI right now. Uh, and I think that uh, the true revolution might, might be actually going on there. Uh, and this is where um, I'm personally putting my effort now. And uh, that's essentially what I wanted to say. And uh, thank you, thanks a lot for listening. And I think we still have some time uh, to discuss a bit. Thanks. Thank you, um, Javier. Uh, okay, so maybe um, before, oh, my thing is not on. Before I, I, I jump in with my own questions, um, I will give priority to the audience. Um, does the audience, someone wants to jump in, wants to uh, put any point across or something? Please feel free. This is an open, an open, uh, um, Yes, please. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Xavier. Javier, sorry uh, for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering, um, when do you think we'll be able to get to the point of creating uh, superatomic electronics uh, post uh, quantum? Superatomic electronic post quantum. I have, I have no no idea what you mean. Can you can you explain a bit? yeah so so electronics um has uh, different stages of development and uh, uh there there is uh right right now we're in um phases below uh super to uh, atomic because uh there's different um uh i've forgotten exactly the the wording but uh, I, I suggest uh, you go look it up uh, and uh, and hopefully you can get back to us um because it's, it's very interesting. It's a, it's, it's it's very high level um, uh, uh, quantum physics, uh, and uh, I, I know one researcher who I spoke to, Latoya, from America. I've forgotten her second name, and she researches uh, superatomic um, uh, materials uh, for, so for I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I don't I don't know what uh, what it is. Uh, I can tell you that the, the okay are you talking about scales i mean the the kind of devices that are right now in the labs for instance in semiconducting are uh not at the atomic scale so it's it's more like a uh, tens of nanometers um already you see a lot of problem due to the fact that you uh, anytime you, you know like an electron get trapped at the surface or something like that it gives you a lot of noise so it's it's very hard for the tiny system like that to be reproducible then you have the atomic physics, like uh, Rydberg atoms, or you have the trapped ions. And those, those are difficult, different. They come from atomic physics. Um, they are very clean because, for instance, all atoms are the same. Uh, but it's very difficult to control. I mean, essentially, you can you can rank. I'm not sure I'm not trying your question. I'm sorry, because I, <laughs> I'm, I don't, but, uh, you, you can essentially classify all quantum technology according to um, how well uh they are connected to the environment there are things that are well connected to the environment like super connecting qubits for instance or uh or semi-connecting qubits and those are great because you can you can control them very well you can put all the classical electronics that you know you know all your, your control lines are all the microwave physics and so on but of course since they are you are well connected to the environment uh there is also a lot of decoherence and so you have to fight uh, decurrence much more. Then you have much better systems. Uh, I don't know if you take, for instance, an MV center in diamond, you can have a, a coherence times up to seconds. So you say, oh, it's, it's crazy. It's, I mean, compared to the uh, micro or milliseconds you get in the semiconducting physics, it's great. But then uh, the reason for that is that they are not connected at all to any environment, which means you cannot control them. And, and if you take the ratio, I mean, the number of operations that you can do before you lose coherence, typically it's more or less flat. It's more or less flat across the entire spectrum of, you know, ranging from atomic physics where everything are very slow, you know, typically things happen in milliseconds uh, to things we do in, in, in condensed matter, which is more tens of gigahertz. 
Uh, so you 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 cross several several orders of magnitude, but the number of of uh, operations that you can do uh, is, is not exactly flat. I think I would say there is a sweet spot for superconducting systems. This is my best bet at the moment. But um, okay, on the yeah, uh, I don't know where are the super atoms there. <laughs> Redbirds, maybe you can consider them as super atoms. So there are excited atoms, like very big ones. I don't know where, where what is this, <laughs> but it's not a term we use in physics. I can look it up later, but maybe not in real time. Yeah, thank you very much. Other questions? Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. It's it, it's very great. Uh, you you mentioned that uh, quantum computing is not tagging along with what's happening on the lab. Um, inside the labs uh what 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 what's you know, in your mind or what 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 can you propose uh or suggest as a as a track for quantum computing to tag along with uh, the what's inside the labs for example well i'm, I'm sorry to say that I, I think it won't it just won't work at least it won't work with the ideas we have on the table right now so either someone came up with something totally crazy that nobody thought about uh, or we just have to wait for a long, long time on up. I don't know, but at least for from what we have, from the data I have now, uh, it's 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 always very difficult to extrapolate to the future. But at least I can say that everything that is that, me or... that is proposed right now doesn't scale to something useful. Uh, more than that, it's difficult to say. But I, I don't see a route. Uh, the route I see is through classical computing. Uh, on the, the, this quantum-inspired algorithm that I mentioned very briefly at the end. Um, Xavier, can I come in? Um, just out of interest, photosynthesis is a way that nature is making use of quantum principles. And could you not argue that's a form of quantum computation? In other words, there may be problems that perhaps are more suitable for quantum uh, compute, uh, a form of quantum computation like photosynthesis. Maybe we just haven't thought about it. Maybe you're right. Lots of problems are. Uh, classical in nature, a need a classical approach, but there, perhaps there's still problems that are fundamentally quantum and uh, need an approach that is quantum. Otherwise, photosynthesis wouldn't work, would it? All right, okay, let's see. <laughs> uh, so, first, um, I don't call uh, font photosynthesis a, a computer. Uh, for me, a computer, I, I have a, probably a too narrow definition, but for me, a computer is something that computes. Uh, so, I would call it something else. And I'm not excluding that something else might happen. Actually, I, I'm hoping that we will find other kind of applications for the quantum hardware than computing. Uh, and I don't know what yet what it will be. But I mean, there is already these things around sensing. There are a lot of things going on. Uh, and I, I just don't call computing. I mean, it's just a question of terminology, I guess. I mean, if you want to call your your plant uh, a computer, you can. But I, I just don't. Um, and then uh, it's true that photosynthesis, uh, there is some, some quantum mechanics involved, for sure. I mean, there is quantum mechanics involved in everything, but in this in particular, I don't think that entanglement uh, is a huge part of what happens in photosynthesis. Uh, actually, we pretty much know that it's, it's not super relevant. I mean, it's, it, 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 has a, it, has a, it, it plays a little bit. I mean, I'm doing chemistry at the moment. I, we are applying this tensor network to chemistry problem. So I, I've looked into these kind of things. Uh, and entanglement is not very big, uh, which means that probably we can actually tackle, for instance, at least understand photosynthesis with classical approaches. Um, and and uh, so these are things that are going on right now. Uh, a lot of new algorithms in quantum chemistry are, are, are being uh, looked at. Uh, and, I, and I have a lot of hope that we will be able to understand better these processes and maybe to do some engineering of you know, artificial plants or something like that. Uh, to, uh, to solve, the, solve some of the energy problem. This is for a long-term future, um, but I, I just don't call that computing, yeah. Okay, anyone else wants to come in? Well, I have a, qu a, a, a question. Uh, some, what do you think about uh, the argument of some um, suggestions that 
um, rather than waiting or building a monolith, trying to build a monolith type of uh, you know quantum uh, quantum device, uh, maybe rather you could uh, you know build a smaller uh, ones and then network them together in a in a sense of uh, distributed uh, quantum computing. Uh, photonics, for example, could be a, a good candidate for for uh, for for that. Some argue. Though there are some challenges with that, we know all that. Like uh, photons, for example, are very hard to to make them to interact with each other and uh, and these things. Yep. Okay. Um, well. Okay. First, I'd like to say that I uh, that's my personal take. If I if I had to bet all my my retirement money on on some platform, the last one I would choose are the photons, right? For exactly the argument that you gave, there is no way you can make a deterministic gate with photons. Uh, they just do not interact. So, so yes, they are perfect coherence time. For, there is a good reason for that. I mean, there is no term that couple a photon to another photon. Uh, even the, the best nonlinear. I mean, okay. At the end of the day, we have to use photo detectors, and we just absorb them. Uh, and, and, I, 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 and also, the best single photon source that we have at the moment, they have at best eighty percent. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's really terrible. You have to repeat the experiments millions of times before you get uh, one experiment that actually corresponds to what you want to do. Uh, then the more general question about networking these things, uh, this is moving the problem to a different position, but it's not solving it. I mean, you still need to tell me what are the fidelities that you get when you try to untangle two remote things. And I don't think it's helping. I mean, I think at the moment it's, it's, it's worse, much worse. Which is why nobody with sense is doing that. It's already tough to control things that you have on, you know, there in your office, in your cryostat, the Russian fridge. Uh, and so also there are tons of problems. So we don't have good couplers if you want to convert microwaves to optical photons, for instance. Uh, I mean, we just don't know how to do that in practice right now. I mean, people are working on it, but it's hard. Uh, so I see that for more as a, a even more challenging thing that might be interesting once, but, but not as a short-term solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Just following the same thread and um, the, the way of thinking, um, I just, uh, my question is asking for, for your uh, opinion about uh, an idea or a paper specific. It, it, it was, um, dividing the, the qubits that you, you, you should um, measure um, like trillion times or whatever the times to, to get an answer. So uh, every, every trial, not, not, not to measure all the qubits, but um, some of them, subset, we call, they call it, and uh, they, they keep the relation and at the end, uh, the, the, the result was good in, 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 from the point of view of, of quantum computing, but I, I don't know um if this um, interests you or, or or find it uh, possible to solve some issues so okay uh, so you could be talking about several things one idea was actually to do what's called measurement based quantum computing is this what you have in mind yeah, yeah okay yeah. uh okay i i looked into that but not very deeply uh and i convinced myself that it's it's essentially equivalent to to the gate computing and it can be in, it could be interesting for instance for photons it, it might be it, for photons it might be a better way to do things um but it's not a game changer and in particular it, it says nothing about uh, about this error rate that i uh, it, it, there's no reason why it should improve the error rate that i mentioned before everything is in the fidelity really it's it's on the on the so you you I don't think there is a shortcut. I mean, uh, if you look at the big picture, everything you see at your scale is classical. Even though all the equations are quantum mechanics, I mean, we are all described by quantum mechanics, we all behave classically. And that means that uh, whenever you start to average out quantum mechanics on slightly large scale, most of the interesting effect kind of disappear, right? You get superposition, stuff like that. Uh, um, and that's exactly what decoherence is about, right? When, whenever you, you start to entangle yourself with the rest of the world, uh, you lose the nice features that you are trying to, uh, to keep in quantum mechanics. And, and, and so if there is not a clear argument in a technique why it should help with respect to that, uh, then there is no reason that it should help to make quantum computing uh, real. Thanks.
Well, um, so it, I guess it's fair, uh, Xavier, to, <laughs> Xavier, to say uh, um, you certainly don't see any um, potential benefits of uh, you know continuing to uh, travel through this uh, NISC era. <laughs> um, no, I'm not saying uh, that. Oh. At, at, mm. I, I mean, uh, so first, I hate this idea of NIST. Uh, you know, these are just the hardware that we have been working on that is scaling up. And at some point, someone decided to give them a different name. But uh, there is, you know, there is no NISC. There are just experiments in the lab that are scaling up to do more complicated things on more interesting things, right? And, and it's interesting, and we should keep going doing that because we are learning a lot about quantum mechanics. We are learning about uh, entanglement. We are doing experiments that are crazy interesting. It's just that we have no application for the moment, and we should stop pretending that we are making a computer while what we are really doing is a bunch of extremely nice experiments. Thank you. But then, it's, uh, isn't it then useful then? We talk about quantum-inspired algorithms, for instance. Um, so to have those, uh, we would have to continue you know, in this exploration thing. Maybe we'll find new class of uh, uh, algorithms that we never uh, came across uh, before because of uh, exactly this rather like incremental way of doing things. By all means, yes. Mm. We should keep doing that. We should we should keep doing research. It's super interesting. It's also a lot of things are now essentially crossing one field to another. Like uh, atomic physicists are starting to discuss with optical guys. We're starting to discuss with uh, nanoelectronic people. Uh, it's it's very very uh, interesting time to to be working in this field. Um, it's just that this is very very far away from applications. So that's, that's that's all I wanted to convey. Mm. I guess it's also your point is uh, uh, your main point is to say you know um, the way uh, quantum computers are being sold in the media, at least in the popular media nowadays, is as if uh, you know <laughs> they're already doing the the stuff, the holy grails thing, you know, that we expect them to do, which is oh, yeah. no way near. Uh, I guess that's 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 one of the takeaways from. from I just this. stopped. I just stopped reading that because because mm. it was too embarrassing. Mm. And but also companies, true. to be fair, a lot of companies. Companies, um, companies uh, and, and even to be really fair, mm. even some of my colleagues uh, mm. in private, they're all saying like, ah, this is bullshit, but we are having fun. But but in when they write grants, when they write introduction of papers, they, 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 they use the hype to uh, to get, you know, funded and stuff. And, mm. and I think they should stop doing that because uh, it's, it's not helping. And at some point, you know, it's always the same at some point. Uh, the politics, uh, people that are giving the money, they will get tired of because they will see that the applications are not coming. Uh, and then if you lie too much, then you it gets even worse, right? It's, I think it's better to, uh, to be very frank about what is the state. It's, it's, it's amazing physics. A lot of things are going on. We are just in totally uncharted territory. Uh, but uh, as it was when we first discovered electricity, and, you know, people didn't start to to sell right away, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, like uh, so. So we should essentially. It's as if we just discover the transistor, and we we just starting to hire web designers. I mean, okay, in that case, it would have been not too bad. But you, we just don't know what's going what what's going to be the application. A follow up on that is uh, something you just said before <laughs> about this thing uh, about the funding um, aspect of all this. You know, the misalignment, I guess. You know, where uh, I guess um, maybe the funding system is broken because nobody will fund <laughs> someone to uh, go and disprove something. I guess it's not. It's not that. Uh, um, oh, I, I get a lot of funding. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. Uh, honestly, I, I'm not complaining. Mm. I, I get funded. Uh, right now, there is so much money pouring that you, you can write just anything with the word quantum in it and you get money. Mm. Uh, I'm just worried about what is going to happen next uh, when the, the application actually don't arrive. Mm. Mm. And that's actually one of the questions. Uh, Berend, I think, um, was it Berend? I saw something pop up before. I don't have the full control of the chat. Uh, is it about quantum hype or something? Uh, we are coming to... Yeah, Baron, can you? Yeah, yeah, I just said that we'll be all guilty of feeding the hype hype cycle. It looks a bit like this. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. the exception, and Scott Aaron. 
Well, I mean, we, we are all, I mean, uh, optimistic about in the sense of uh, this being a, like a, an amazing science, right? You know, as he was saying about in the early stages of uh, the with the potential, obviously, if it works, <laughs> obviously there are engineering challenges. You know, I, I think this is one of the reasons that we uh, we invited a year to treat because there are there seem to be two camps. <laughs> there is the super optimistic camps, you know, who who ignore. Well, they won't ignore the uh, they don't ignore the challenges, but it's like okay, the challenges will be overcome, and some of, some even put these very aggressive timelines say okay we will overcome these challenges in like i think there are companies hardware companies promising a false tolerant quantum computer in maybe five years or less <laughs> oh actually i can i can show you if you want i have roadmaps with with the quantum computers uh, in five years on the the date from 2010. wow <laughs> this show so it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah you can take the same roadmap and apply them right now and uh, you don't have to change uh, you know one one word <laughs> Uh, um, I, I think we are scientists, so it's not about being optimistic or pessimistic. Or I mean, who cares about what we, we our feelings? You know, we we just we should work with fact. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and there is something with quantum computing that people stop using their brain on their their rationality. And if you know you are allowed to have an opinion on uh, let's say what well, given technology, if you understand it. If you have studied the mass, if you have studied the, the papers, you you know exactly what's going on. You have an opinion, we can discuss it, fair enough. A lot of people have opinions on things they don't understand. Uh, and, and I see in particular it's true, one, one aspect is that uh, there is really this huge dichotomy between physicists that understand the physics very well, but honestly they have no clue about what is quantum error correction or what are the, is the algorithm sure. This for them is just some very abstract things. I don't understand. I, I've seen recently we have a paper on Grover. People have no idea of what an oracle is practically, what why it should be. So the physicists don't understand nothing about the, the abstract aspect, quantum error correction. And vice versa, all these this, uh, people about quantum error correction, they have usually no clue about physics, but to a point I was surprised. I, I remember a, a conversation, um, um, some uh, that was already 10 years ago, with a, a friend, a mathematician, and I was explaining him why I, I, I thought that that show had no chance to work, and and he was very nice, and he, he let me speak, and uh, and after ten minutes he stopped me and said, "But Xavier, I thought we already had a quantum computer," <laughs> and because because we use the same word quantum computer for a chip with fifty qubits. Uh, where at the end you get to ten to minus three fidelity mm -hmm. uh, and something fault tolerant, you know, with probably billions of qubits that uh, we have no idea how you could cool that down to the Tyson creature. So the same name is used, and then because it's the same name, people just think it's the same thing. But no, what we have at the moment are extremely nice experiments, and already they, they require a, a tremendous amount of engineering to to do you know uh, to do what they can do right now, which is essentially uh, nothing in terms of application. And uh, we're not even there what to show that you could get some sort of error correction. It would be already something. I've, if I see a good, a good logical qubit in my life, I would be already very, very happy. I don't think I will something where you actually manipulate the qubit, not not just uh, get a piece of wood, because getting a piece of wood is easy. Uh, but getting a, a fully logical qubit with so many digits that you can really manipulate currently, that stay, uh, no, that that is not for tomorrow. And you will need many of them uh, to do something useful. Yeah. This is actually follow up of a, a famous say. I think it was one I, I saw somewhere that uh, the quantum stuff don't happen in Hilbert space, but in a lab. <laughs> they do, yeah. So, yeah, you can also extend that to software. You know, it doesn't matter how much Python libraries that you use to write uh, an algorithm. If it cannot be implemented, on nature cannot implement it, or you don't have a way of engineering it in nature, then it's it's just a, a nice, nice piece of uh, uh, code or whatnot. Exactly. Um, at the end, yeah. we need to. Uh, and at the end, you you need to look at your fidelity. If for qubits, mm -hmm. really, if I, you know, when you whenever you see a, a talk, uh, just keep that in your mind. What is the fidelity? How many operations do they have? Uh, what is the fidelity they need? And and and, and, and this will enlighten a lot of of discussions. Yeah, and also a lot of, uh, <laughs> um, you know, for the. Uh, for the for the public you know when they hear these numbers you know um i don't know how many thousands qubits and these things people get impressed wow <laughs> 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 yeah. 
they don't consider what's really um, uh, important, you know, into that, like fidelity and other things that you have to, you know, consider in order for them to be useful, <laughs> even though they might be like, uh, you know, the numbers might sound astonishing, like some companies promising, I don't know how many million qubits. Okay. Which, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But okay. I, I looked uh, at, at many of these companies on the, I mean, not all of them, obviously, but, but uh, um, there is a lot of hype. Even the best ones, you know, even uh, IBM, for instance, they are doing, honestly, they are doing a very good job. I mean, they should because they have a thousand people working on this project. So it's, it's really a thousand engineer and, uh, uh, and they are doing an amazing job. But, but the, I mean, like, for instance, I don't know if you saw, they had a quantum advantage paper like a couple of months ago. Uh, it turned out, so it, it took a week before people could actually do that with uh, tons of networks, actually. I produce it. Just a week. Three weeks later, there were like three, four papers. And the real blow came uh, a month later, where someone essentially got the same thing in mean field. Mean field means, you know, very easy for us. When we do, when, when something like uh, yields in mean field, it means that nothing is happening in your, in your device. And, uh, and that's, that's IBM. They are the most serious of the, of the band. Yeah. Anyone else wants to? Add any comment or any other point before we let uh, Xavier go? Yeah, when do you think we'll be able to use these technologies and, and findings into applications? Uh, you, you know, there, there's so much to be able to possibly go into, and shouldn't there be a, an entire job uh, uh, for people? scientists to to find these things out uh, you know if if uh, the uh, the the target of uh, these papers and projects aren't met for that specific goal but maybe used for something else but you see that that's that's a real problem of quantum computing in terms of sociological problem is that people are trying very hard and very smart people are trying very hard and, and there is just no low hanging fruit that's a big deal. I mean, maybe there is that someone will find it, but so far, pe and people have tried very hard to find low-hanging fruit, and and we we could not. And this is why people have been pushing all these crazy things, uh, since this boson sampling or okay. So, uh, on the, okay, so at the moment, I, I cannot give you a time because I don't even have any idea of what it could be. The only thing there are a few things that work, but there are. I, I would say very far from quantum computing. This is things co co corresponding to sensing, for instance. Uh, sensing, gravitational sensing, uh, NV centers, for instance, the NV centers, you can see it as a qubit, but it's actually now you can make very, very good microscope for, from that, uh, that we use in the lab for, for uh, magnetic microscopy. Uh, these are, you could, you could call them quantum application if you want. It's, it's not using entanglement much, but there are versions where people want to use uh, GSZ uh, states to maybe enhance the, the so, you, so if you have interferometer and you use GSZ, you can actually enhance your, your signal to noise ratio. So these are, okay, could be, but it's not big enough to, you know, to convince the military to give you money or, or to convince the hedge funds to give you money. So what I think will happen, that, but that's really, is that in the not too far future, let's say five years, but okay, uh, uh, the the startup will get start. We get you know the people giving the money to startup will get tired, so most most of them will just disappear, uh, and then we will go back to uh, a state where we are doing research. Uh, I would say in the old way in the lab, uh, in academic labs, and then at some point some application will come up. On, on my bet is that they will have very little to do with what is, is being proposed now. But but it will take time. On how much time, I, I have no idea. Yeah, Second bet is that we will solve a lot of things with, with classical techniques. Like uh, this new fusion of AI and quantum inspired is crazy, crazy strength. It's, it's a lot of things that, a lot of problems that when I was young, for instance, there is a very famous model called the Hubbard model. Uh, it's, it's the most basic model for ITC superconductivity. And when I was starting uh, as a young researcher, there was something called Hubbardite, like the disease of working on the Hubbard model. It has, it has killed so many students that are trying to do something which was just too hard. Well, now this, this model is, is, is actually yielding. 
Like we, we start to have multiple methods on checks uh, in hard uh, re parameter regions of the, of, the, of the, we can calculate now. It was not the case five years ago. So, so uh, a lot of things are going on in the classical part, and that's, that's uh, where I put my money. And George made uh, an interesting comment. In maths, a negative result is still a result. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Disproving something is not possible. That's definitely, uh, or doesn't exist. <laughs> because normally the disproving of uh, in mathematics is a uh, existence uh, type of proofs. Actually, uh, something, something is impossible is very, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other question before I ask my final question to Xavier? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a little yeah. comment on <laughs> some of the stuff that's going on in the chat. Uh, I happen to make the comment when you talk about the finance being biased for people to say we can do something. Uh, across academia, that's also true for publishing. You know, following up with George's comment there, um, that Articles where you say you can do something will get published. There's a bias towards them. Yes. Articles that say, you know, something doesn't work. Journals don't want to touch that. It doesn't sell. Agreed. Uh, you know, and that's just every field. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an issue. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah. an issue. We have seen it, for instance. I don't know if you have followed what happened with the, the topological super, uh, quantum computer, so mm -hmm. the Majorana fermions. Um, the guys that actually found that there was a problem uh, could not get published in Nature. Why there right. were like a series of papers there. Okay, now they have been retracted. Um, but uh, yes, it's it's uh, uh, yes. I think we have a problem there. Personally, my my uh, my take on that is I'm trying to avoid um, uh, most of the journals that are actually on the, um, uh, by, you know run by these big companies that are trying to make money out of uh, our research. Uh, and I'm leaning to, for, toward, for instance, SciPost. I mean, these new journals that are uh, open source, run by scientists, uh, are not for money. Mm. But uh, and it's, it's not a, a complete solution because you know, always a bias always, uh, in favor of what is, uh, uh, you know, what is currently uh, uh, fashionable. And, and there are tons of bias, uh, but at least we can get rid of the biggest ones, I think. Mm. Mm. Thanks. And this one definitely was a, a bigger um, thing because I think uh, um, was it Microsoft who was funding the uh, the research? I think because they were pursuing topological uh, qubits. Yes. <laughs> and uh, there was uh, obviously a huge amount of money involved as well. And sadly, you know, the incentives you start to have the misalignment between you know different parts, and everyone trying to capitalize on something. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, but in the end, the science prevailed, right? Because, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, so, so, the very good scientists spent a lot of time uh, running after mm. uh, Chimera, and I think they could have done much better physics. Uh, Faster, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, it's, yeah, so, yeah, that's true that if you, okay, if you make a claim that interests no one, you can write a wrong paper and <laughs> nobody will notice it. Uh, if you make a very big claim, then at some at some point someone will try to reproduce it, and if you, you know, put too much uh, stuff under the carpet, then it it will you you will you will get caught. Yeah, this it's still this part is still working. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reproducibility. It's like similar thing to this uh, superconducting thing, this conductivity thing that uh, has been. Um, over the past, I think in December or something, someone said they found a, a superconducting material. Uh, um, what was it? Oh, yes. That was yeah. yeah. You know that they had published a paper in Nature. Oh, you, okay, there are several. There is a hydrate, and then there is this uh, uh, this stuff by uh, people from Korea. You, I don't know which one you are. Both, both were crazy. But the hydrate one was, was worse because the guy has published a paper in Nature, retracted because it was essentially bullshit and then he, he did the same thing a second time on nature published him again and then they have to retract it again you know it's like it's it's like as if they had like a zero memory 
Uh, the other was a bit better because, it, okay, the guy claimed something, then it was checked by the community and it didn't uh, add up. So I, I think that's fine. No, so the, 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 there's still some uh, balances, checks and balances there, indefinitely. But people the making claims, it needs to be reproducible. Yeah. Yeah. One, 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 one thing about the <laughs> second one is that because, for instance, in my lab, I have a specialist of these things. And I, when I saw the paper, I asked him, what do you think about it? And, and the, you know, in about 10 minutes, he, he explained me why it couldn't be correct. Mm. And, and so it was obvious to two experts. Uh, so it should never have gone to the main media. You know, we mm. should actually keep these things between ourselves. And when we have settled things, then it should go out. Otherwise, mm. uh, too much junk goes out. So and I think there is something to do to be done also there. Mm. Yeah, and uh, that's actually a very good point because we see that also in uh, the the uh, impact of uh, social media influencers. You know, <laughs> people mm. sharing articles, certain articles like these things oh, uh, when it came out. People influencers <laughs> like in in tech, they started even they are no no expert. They start sharing it. Suddenly, got uh, exposure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and then you get you you your influence actually no correlation with your scientific level. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, uh, yeah. Does anybody remember cold fusion? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> class example, right? <laughs> on, on, on the water, you know, water memory. Recently, I had uh, I had some some neighbors coming for uh, for a drink, on the, on the, on, the, on the just oh, you're a quantum physicist, great. You're going to explain me why uh, uh, homeopathic uh, works, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. With cold fusion, I remember I was a child, I think when there was a big claim or something, and uh, I think one of the scientists actually said uh, from the outright saying, um, if he got out of the experimental lab, you know, he's okay. That's a bad news. <laughs> he should, whatever he was doing, I think he should, uh, if that was true, I think he should have gotten something, uh, some, some sort of... Uh, uh, effect or something being exposed to some sort of radioactive thing um, that we could have uh, seen the traces in his in his thing mm. so it wasn't there for um it didn't happen yes control load fusion <laughs> <laughs> i see the, the yeah, in in france we have this big uh, facility for for fusion like uh, this iter uh, thing uh on, on when I was a, a young scientist, I had a lec set of lectures uh, from a guy working there. I mean, in the previous version, smaller version of that. And yes, uh, the f fusion was for the energy for in 40 years. On 40 years later, it was still in 40 years. Uh, but I think fusion is hard, but I think quantum computing is much harder. Honestly, I think it's a much harder problem. Mm. Maybe because um, okay, I'm closer to it, so I know more of the details on why uh, why it's hard. Um, yeah, so if we want to solve global warming, for instance, we we better look for you know <laughs> slightly easier solution first, and then we we'll see about quantum computing uh, later. Mm. Mm. Okay, if nobody okay. has anything else, I have a final question. <laughs> it's a tricky one, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, say um, in, I don't know how many years, maybe five or 10 years. Uh, okay, let's say 25 years. <laughs> um, you wake up, you see a news to say, indeed, uh, a fault tolerant quantum computer has been built and it's, it's, uh, it's been proven. It's actually fault tolerant because uh, a non fault tolerant compute, uh, quantum computer couldn't solve. Yeah. Which of the, um, if the, if you didn't know what uh, which kind of technologies they use, which of the approaches you think from the existing ones, you know, from superconducting, you know, trapped ion and, and so on, you would uh, put your bet that it would be the one that was uh, uh, able to achieve that? Superconductors. Superconductors. Okay. Yeah, it's, you see, superconductors, they start with um, uh, they start with a good advantage. It's, it's a macroscopic quantum phenomenon. It's actually one of the only quantum phenomena that we have at macroscopic scale. And that's a huge help. You are protected from a lot of things. Uh, you, you have a, a phase which is coherent over a large scale. So you have it, you know, it's it's a very good compromise. It's not, it's not, you know, there are still a lot of problems. I could make a list, you know, uh, very long list of things that are uh, that are very difficult there. Uh, 
still, it's, I think it's the best bet. Atomic physics is not going to do it, just for a very simple reason. They are just far too slow. I mean, the, the scale is given by nature. It's, it, it would just take forever to run anything. Even if you could make this scale, on a, it would just take thousands of years to run anything useful. So you just, they are out of the equation right now. I mean, unless I missed something, but big. Uh, and um, photons, I, I said that this is where I actually I would put the least money. <laughs> uh, so at the moment, I would put my money on, uh, on semiconductors are so, so, so dirty that uh, at the moment, it's a joke. Yeah. I mean, the, people have been able to untangle two, and uh, uh, more than two, it's already very, very challenging. And it's the, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't see a path forward there. So I would put my money on superconductors. Okay, so in 25 years, we'll, uh, if it happens in 25 years, you know, we will replay this on if YouTube still exists. That's, obviously. That's only, <laughs> only if I have to invest my money in quantum computing. If I am allowed to invest mm. my money in something else, <laughs> mm. then I would put, probably put it in AI or I don't know what. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, thank you so, guys for having me. It was a lot of fun to discuss with you. And uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe we see each other in the future. In a yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming and uh, giving a talk to the community. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you back again. <laughs> Maybe if there is a, a, a breakthrough happen, for instance, in the in, in the next few months, like some companies are promising, you know, uh, maybe you will change your mind as well. That's also a welcome. If, I, I if would you, be, you change I would your be, mind, <laughs> please feel free to, 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 to come back. I would be very happy to be proven wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Bye-bye. Okay. So to the rest, everyone, thank you for showing up and contributing to this uh, um, discussion. And uh, see you next time. Bye. Okay, I think I forgot to disconnect. Somehow it's not uh, allowing me to disconnect. Why is this? Oh, I need to stop recording. <laughs>